Hello friends, welcome to Shankar Summary 2024. Today we are about to discuss 15 most important and often repeated miscellaneous topics which is very crucial for this year prelims. Behind me are the list of articles that we are about to discuss. So without much delay, let's get started. Multilateral Export Control Regime Let's understand this topic through a question. Look at this question. India is a member to which of the following multilateral export control regime? Australian Group, Vasnar Agreement, Nuclear Supplier Group, Missile Technology Control Regime, Zanzir Committee. See, in this question, five multilateral export control regimes are given. We have to find India as a member to which of these regimes. First of all, know that multilateral export control regimes are voluntary or non-binding agreement of the major nuclear fuel or the material supplier countries. They are aiming to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery means and related equipment technology. Now look at these two previous year questions. These two questions are about Australia Group and Vassinar Agreement and NSG. These were asked in UPSC exams of 2011 prelims and 2018 prelims respectively. Now in the news also, we are frequently hearing about the multilateral export control regimes. So it is very important to know about these regimes from the prelims perspective. Now let's first take about Australian group. The Australia group is an informal association which was formed in 1985. It aims to allow exporting countries to minimize the risk of assisting the proliferation of chemical and biological weapons. In simple terms, the Australia group works to prevent the exportation of chemical and biological weapons and the materials used to produce them. The Australia group consists of 43 participating nations. All the states participating in the Australia group are the parties to the Chemical Weapon Convention and the Biological Weapon Convention. India became a member of this group in the year 2018. Now coming to Vasinar Agreement. See this agreement was established in July 1996. It is a voluntary export control regime. The Vasinar Agreement contributes to the regional and international security and stability. This is by promoting transparency and greater responsibility in the transfer of conventional arms and the dual use goods and technologies through a regular information exchange among its members. Here the dual use goods means software and the technology that can be used for both civilian and military applications. Currently 42 member countries are there under this agreement. India became a member in 2017. Note that India assumed the chairmanship of Vasinar agreement on 1st January 2023 for a period of one year. Now coming to NSG that is the Nuclear Suppliers Group is a group of 48 nuclear supplier countries. It seeks to contribute the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. See the NSG has its own guidelines. One of the important NSG guidelines contain the non-proliferation principle which was adopted in 1994. The principle mandates that a supplier country has to transfer the nuclear items only when a country is satisfied that the transfer would not contribute to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Know that India is not a member of NSG. See, India is trying to join NSG, but it has been continuously opposed by China. This is based on the grounds that India is not a signatory to Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, that is NPT. So as of now, India is not a member of NSG. Now coming to MTCR, that is the Missile Technology Control Regime, is an informal political understanding among the participating country. It seeks to limit the proliferation of missiles and missile technology. The MTCR was formed in 1987 by the G7 countries such as Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK and USA. India became a member of MTCR in 2016. Now coming to Zanzer Committee. The Zanzer Committee was formed in 1971. It was formed as a forum to establish guidelines for implementing the export control provisions of non-proliferation treaty. This is among the nuclear supplier members of NPT. The Zanzer committee maintain a list of controlled nuclear related items called trigger list. The trigger list is a list of source or a special fissionable materials and equipments that are designed or prepared for the processing, use or the production of special fissionable materials. Know that India is not a member of Zanzer committee. Now coming back to the question, see, India is a member of Australian group was in our agreement and MTCR only. So the correct answer for this question is option B, 1, 2, 1, 4 only. With this, let's move to our next topic of discussion. 
Our next topic is Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Let's start with the question. Look at this question. With reference to Non-Proliferation Treaty, consider the following statements. It aims to promote cooperation in the field of peaceful use of nuclear energy. India is one of the founding members of this treaty. As per the provisions of NPT, all the member countries are required to give up any present or the future plans to build the nuclear weapons. So before trying to answer this question, let's understand in brief about Non-Proliferation Treaty. See, NPT refers to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which is commonly known as Non-Proliferation Treaty. Here the term Non-Proliferation refers to the policy of preventing the spread or increase in the number of weapons. See, on June 12, 1968, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution 2373. This resolution commanded the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. So the Non-Proliferation Treaty was opened for signing in the year 1968 itself and the treaty entered into force in 1970. The NPT contains 11 articles that applies both to nuclear and the non-nuclear weapon states. Now coming to the member countries of the treaty, see a total of 191 states have signed the treaty including the P5 or the permanent members to the United Nations Security Council. The P5 countries include US, UK, Russia, France and China. Know that countries such as India, Israel and Pakistan have never signed the treaty of NPT. Now let's see why India did not sign NPT. See the articles 2 and 4 of NPT require the countries to give up any present or the future plans to build the nuclear weapons. But the same article exempt the P5 countries for such requirements. So India is consistently opposing the NPT by terming it as a discriminatory treaty. So because of these two articles, NPT was not signed by India. Now coming to the objectives of NPT, firstly, NPT aims to prevent the spread of nuclear weapon and the nuclear technology beyond the P5 countries. Secondly, it promotes cooperation in a peaceful use of nuclear energy. And finally, NPT aims to further the goal of achieving nuclear disarmament. Now coming back to the question, see the first statement is correct. As we saw now, it is one of the objective of NPT. That is, it aims to promote the cooperation in the field of peaceful use of nuclear energy. And the second statement is incorrect. See, India has never signed NPT and it is not a member of NPT. And the third statement is also incorrect. See, the Article 2 and 4 of NPT require the member countries to give up any present or future plans to build nuclear plants. But there are some exceptions. The article exempt the P5 countries from such requirements. So the provision of NPT do not include to all the countries. And also one more thing. Look carefully. The question asks only for the incorrect statements. So here the second and the third statements are incorrect. So the correct answer for this question will be option B, 2 and 3 only. With this, let's move on to our next topic. Our next topic is International Atomic Energy Agency, also known as IAEA. See, the International Atomic Energy Agency is an intergovernmental organization that seeks to promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy and it is also preventing the use of nuclear energy for any military purpose, including nuclear weapons. Note that it is one of the agencies of United Nations. Now coming to its formation, in 1953, the then US President proposed the creation of IAEA in his Autumn's for Peace address to the UN General Assembly. Then in October 1957, a conference on the IAEA statue was held at the United Nations headquarters to approve the founding documents of International Atomic Energy Agency. And eventually, the statue of the IAEA was approved on 23rd October 1956 and the statue came into force in 29 July 1957 and thus formally established as International Atomic Energy Agency. It is an autonomous organization. Though it is autonomous, it has to report to both United Nations General Assembly and United Nations Security Council. See, the International Atomic Energy Agency has its headquarters in Vienna, Austria. In addition to that, IAEA also has two regional safeguard offices. They are located in Toronto, Canada and in Tokyo, Japan. Now let us see some of its important functions. See, the International Atomic Energy Agency serves as a forum for promoting and assisting the research, development and the practical application of peaceful uses of nuclear technologies and nuclear power worldwide. The IAEA provides international safeguards against the misuse of nuclear technology and nuclear materials. The agency is also promoting nuclear safety and nuclear security standards. The agency will also overlook the implementation of the safety and the security standards. These are some of main functions of IAEA. Now, talking about its membership, see the IAEA has 175 member states as of today. The latest two countries to join IAEA are 
St. Kitties and Nevis and Tonga. Note that India became the member of this organization in 1957 itself. With this basic understanding about IAEA, let's try to solve this question. Consider the following statements with respect to comprehensive safeguard agreements of IAEA. The safeguards under this agreement are implemented only in the countries which are party to the non-proliferation treaty. The safeguards are implemented in India on the basis of item specific agreements with IAEA. Which of the statements given above are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. See the statement one is wrong because the safeguards are implemented in non-NPT member states also. Now coming to the statement two, it is correct as we know that in India, the safeguards are implemented on the basis of item specific agreements with IAEA. So the correct answer for this question is option B, two only. With this, let's move to our next topic. Our next topic of discussion is Financial Action Task Force, shortly known as FATF. See, FATF is an international watchdog on the financial crimes such as money laundering and terror financing. It was established at the G7 summit of 1989 in Paris. This is to address the loopholes in the global financial system. This was mainly spoken or brought into light after the member countries raised concerns about the growing money laundering activities. Note that FATF also added terror financing as a main focus area. See, this was done after the 9-11 terror attack on the US. This was later broadened to include restricting the funding of weapons of mass destruction. See, the FATF currently has 39 members. The decision-making body of FATF is also known as its plenary. It meets three times a year. Its meetings are even attended by observer organizations such as World Bank, and some officers of United Nations and the regional developmental banks. Now let's look into it, working procedures. Firstly, FATF sets standard or recommendation for the countries. This is to plug the loopholes in the financial systems. Secondly, FATF conducts regular peer-reviewed evaluation. This is called mutual evaluation of the countries. This is to check their performance on the standard prescribed by it. See the reviews are carried out by FATF and FATF style regional bodies. They then release a mutual evaluation reports. Thirdly, the FATF draws up time-bound action plans. This is for the countries that don't perform well on certain standards. See the recommendation range from assessing the risk of crimes to setting up legislation. Then the recommendation also include investigative and judicial mechanisms too. See at the end of every plenary meeting, FATF comes out with two list of countries. They are grey and blacklist. So what are these lists? See the words grey and blacklist do not exist in the official FATF lexicon. So let's see them what they actually means. See the grey listed countries are designated as jurisdiction under increased monitoring and also they work with the FATF to counter criminal financial activities. Whereas the blacklist countries are high risk jurisdictions. These are the subjects to call for action. These nations have huge deficiencies in their anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financial regimes. Presently, as of 23rd February 2024, there are these following countries under jurisdiction under increased monitoring. They are Bulgaria, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Croatia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, Jamaica, Kenya, Mali, Mozambique, Namibia, Nigeria, Philippines, Senegal, South Africa, South Sudan, Syria, Tanzania, Turkey, Vietnam and Yemen. Let's now see the major difference between the grey and blacklisted countries. See when you take the blacklisted countries, the FATF calls on the members and the non-members to apply enhanced due diligence. And in the most serious cases, members are told to apply countermeasures such as sanctions on the blacklisted countries. Currently, North Korea, Myanmar and Neron are on the blacklist. See, not only this, when the countries are listed in FATF blacklist, it is hard to get any aid from the organizations like IMF or Asian Development Bank and European Union. It may also affect the capital inflows via foreign direct investment or portfolio investment. With this, let's move to our next topic. Our next topic is about food and agricultural organization. See, recently FAO has released Food Outlook, a biannual report that contained forecast of production, trade, utilization and stock levels across the world's major basic foodstuff. 
With this backdrop, let us understand the basics about FAO, which is very important for the prelims 2024. See, FAO was founded in 1945 and it is also a specialized agency of United Nations that leads international efforts to defeat hunger. It has its headquarters in Rome, Italy and also it has 194 countries including India and European Union as its members. Its major goals include eradicating hunger, food insecurity, malnutrition, poverty and it also strives for sustainable management and utilization of natural resources. And also know that World Food Day that is being celebrated on 16th October is celebrated to mark the anniversary of the founding of FAO and also FAO works closely with World Food Program and International Fund for Agricultural Development. Here let's also understand one more important thing about the specialized agency of UN. There are about 17 specialized agencies. They are Food and Agricultural Organization, International Civil Aviation Organization, International Fund for Agricultural Development, International Labor Organization, International Monetary Fund, International Monetary, International Maritime Organization, International Telecommunication Union, UNESCO, United Nations, Industrial Developmental Organization, World Tourism Organization, Universal Postal Union, WHO, World Intellectual Property Organization, and World Metrological Organization and World Bank Group, which includes International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, International Developmental Association, International Financial Corporation. See, the UN Specialized Agency or the International Organization working with UN in accordance with the relationship agreement between each organization and the UN. And also the specialized agency each have a process for admitting the members and appointing their administrative heads. Article 58 of the Charter states that UN will make a recommendation for the coordination of the policies and the activities of the specialized agency. Here the coordination is facilitated through United Nations Economic and Social Council and the Chief Executive Board. With this understanding, let us try to answer the question given here. Look at this question. Which among the following reports are released by the Food and Agricultural Organization? Food Price Index, World Hunger Index, State of World Fisheries and Aquaculture, State of World's Forest. Choose the correct code from the options given below. 1, 3 and 4 only, 1 and 2 only, 1, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 4 only. See the correct answer is option A, 1, 3 and 4 only. Because the Global Hunger Index is a peer-reviewed annual report jointly published by Concern Worldwide and Wealth Hunger Life. That's all about this discussion. Let's move on to our next topic. The next topic is about United Nations peacekeeping. See, recently the 75th anniversary of the beginning of UN peacekeeping was celebrated. It was mainly held to posthumously award Hammersjord Medal to the peacekeepers who died in 2022. With this backdrop, let us see about UN peacekeeping in brief. See, they are formally created in 1992 as the Department of Peacekeeping Operation. See, the Department of Peacekeeping Operation traces its traces its route to the 1948 with the creation of the first UN peacekeeping operations. See, up to the late 1980s, the peacekeeping operations were operated through the UN Office of Special Political Affairs. See, they are mainly dedicated to assisting the member states and the Secretary General in their efforts to maintain international peace and security. And their main functions are providing political and executive directions to the United Nations peacekeeping operations around the world and maintain contact with the Security Council, troops and financial contributions. Here, it is very important to know about India's contribution to the UN peacekeeping. See, they are the third largest troop contributor with around 7,000 personnel deployed in 8 out of the 13 active missions. And we are also the first country to deploy an all-women contingent in 2017. See, with this basic understanding about UN peacekeeping, let's try to solve this question given here. Consider the following statements. Blue helmets or the military personnel of the UN that works to promote stability, security and peace process. All military personnel working under the blue helmet are the first and the foremost members of UN and they work under the command and the control of UN. Which of the statements above are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. The correct answer to this question is option A, one only. See, the second statement is incorrect because all the military personnel working under the blue helmet are the first and the foremost members of their own national armies and are then seconded to the work under the command and control of UN. That's all about this topic. With this, let's move on to our next discussion. Our next topic is G20. See, recently, India held the presidency of G20 summit held in New Delhi with the theme Vasudeva Kodumbagam or the One Earth, One Family, One Future. 
This makes G20 a very crucial topic for prelims 2024. So let's get started with our discussion. See, G20 was founded in 1999 following the Asian financial crisis as a forum for financial ministers and central bank governors to discuss global economic and financial issues. It plays an important role in shaping and strengthening the global architecture and governance on all the major international economic crises. Its membership includes 19 countries and European Union. And the list is displayed here. Please have a look. And also know that India has been a founding member of G20. Let's now see about its working. See, G20 summit held annually under the leadership of a rotating presidency. See, the presidency is supported by the Trochia, that is, the current, previous and the incoming presidency. In 2023, the Trochia consists of India, Indonesia and Brazil, whereas for 2024, it will be Brazil, India and South Africa. And also, the summit will have two parallel tracks. They are financial track and the Sherpa track. Here, it is very important to know that the G20 does not have any permanent secretariat or staff. With this, let us see some important outcome of G20 New Delhi Summit. It led to the adoption of G20 New Delhi Leaders Joint Declaration. This includes themes like accelerating the progress on SGG, on sustainable development goals, women empowerment, reforms of multilateral institutions, and international taxation and global peace. And it also led to the launch of Global Biofuel Alliance. See, the Global Biofuel Alliance is a multi-stakeholder alliance of governments, international organizations and industries, an initiative by India as a G20 chair, bringing together the biggest consumers and the producers of biofuel to drive the development and the deployment of biofuel. There are about 24 countries and 12 international organizations have joined this alliance. It includes 8 G20 countries, 4 G20 invited countries like Bangladesh, Mauritius, Singapore, UAE and also 12 non-G20 countries. In addition, there are 12 international organizations too. And another most important outcome was the establishing of India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor that is IMEC. The next one which is very very important is the formal inclusion of African Union as a permanent member of G20. With this let us see some basics about African Union. See its headquarters is located in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. It was actually launched in 2002 as a successor to the organization of African Unity which has been operating since 1963 to 1999. It consists of 55 member states that make up the whole countries of African continent. Its main aim was to promote Africa's growth and economic development by championing citizen inclusion and increased cooperation and integration of African states. See, it is the second regional organization to become a permanent member of G20 after the European Union. And recently, African Union has suspended Niger from all the activity due to military coup. In addition to all the above major facts that we have discussed, and also know that G20 represents 85% of global GDP, 75% of global trade, and also two-thirds of world's population. With this basic understanding, let us try to answer the question given here. Look at this question. With reference to G20, consider the following statement. The term Sherpa denotes countries representative to the G20 summit. The term G20 Troika refers to the current and the next two presidencies of G20. Which of the statements given above are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. The correct answer is option A, one only. See, the G20 Sherpa of 2023 is a high-ranking official designated by G20 member country to represent their leader typically the head of state or government, in preparation to the annual G20 Leader Summit. And with respect to this statement too, see, the G20 Summit is held annually with a rotating presidency. And in 2023, India held the presidency of G20. The group does not have any permanent secretariat and it is actually supported by the previous, current and the future holders of the presidency. And it is known as Troika. In 2023, Troika consists of Indonesia, Brazil, and India. With this, let's move to our next topic. Next, we are going to discuss about European Union's new crypto legislation. See, the European Parliament, that is, the legislative body of 27 country bloc, European Union, has approved world's first comprehensive rules to bring largely unregulated cryptocurrency markets under the ambit of regulation by the government authority. Let us now see about the new legislation in brief. See, the regulation is called Markets in the Crypto Assets shortly known as MICA or MICA. 
MICA is the most comprehensive regulatory framework for the digital assets to date. The rules will impose a number of requirements on the crypto platforms, token issuers and the traders around transparency, disclosure, authorization and the supervision of transaction. Here the platforms will be required to inform customers about the risk associated with their operations while sale of new tokens will also come under this regulation. Let us now see about its coverage. The MICA legislation will apply to the crypto assets like Bitcoin, Ethereum and stablecoins. The crypto assets can be understood as a digital representation of a value or a right that uses cryptography for security and it is in the form of coin or a token or any other digital medium which may be transferred and stored electronically using a distributed ledger technology or similar technology. Let us now see what is a stablecoin. See a stablecoin or digital tokens that aim to stay pegged to a value with more stable assets that is a fiat currency like US dollar or any other stable cryptocurrency. Here the MICA regulation will apply not only to the traditional cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum but also the newer ones like stablecoins. MICA will establish three new rules for the three types of stablecoins that is asset reference tokens which are linked to a multiple currency, commodity or cryptocurrency, e-money tokens which are linked to a single currency, utility tokens or intended to provide access to goods or services that will be supplied by the issuer of that token. Let us now see what are the assets that are not covered under MICA. See the MICA scope will not regulate digital assets that would qualify as a transferable security and functions like shares or their equivalents and other crypto assets that already qualify as a financial instruments under existing regulations. And also here it is very important to know that most part of non-fungible tokens are also excluded from this legislation. And also MICA will not regulate the central bank digital currency. Moving forward, let us now see about the regulation of cryptocurrency in India. See India is yet to have a comprehensive regulatory framework for the crypto assets. The draft legislation on the same is reportedly in the process. However, Indian government has taken certain steps to bring cryptocurrencies under the ambit of specific authorities and taxation. In the budget 2022, the finance minister has said the cryptocurrency trading in India has seen a phenomenal increase and imposed a 30% tax on the income from the transfer of any virtual digital assets. In March 2023, the government placed all the transaction involving virtual digital assets under the preview of Prevention of Money Laundering Act. That's all about this discussion. With this basic understanding, let us try to solve the question given here. Look at this question. With reference to non-fungible tokens, consider the following statements. They enable the digital representation of physical asset. They are unique cryptographic tokens that exist in a blockchain. They can be traded or exchanged at the equivalents and therefore can be used as a medium of commercial transaction. Which of the statements given above are correct? 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. The correct answer is option A, 1 and 2 only. See the statement 1 and 2 are only correct. Statement 3 is incorrect because unlike cryptocurrency, NFT cannot be exchanged at equivalents. With this, let's move to the next topic for our discussion. Our next topic is BRICS. Since there are new members has been added to this grouping, it becomes very important for prelims 2024. So let's get started with our discussion. See recently, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates have confirmed that they are joining the BRICS block. With this backdrop, let's see the basic facts about BRICS. See, BRICS is an acronym for the grouping of the world's leading and emerging economies, namely Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. The term BRIC was actually coined by Jim O'Neill, the then chairman of Goldman Sachs in 2001. The first BRIC summit took place in the year 2009 in Yekaterinburg of Russia and also in 2010 South Africa formally joined this association making it BRICS, B-R-I-C-S, yes denoting the South Africa and also the BRICS Leaders Summit is convened annually and also know that here it is important to note that the chairmanship of this forum is rotated annually among the members in accordance with the acronym B-R-I-C-S. Together, BRICS account for about 40% of the world's population and about 30% of GDP making it a crucial economic engine. In addition to this, during the 6th BRICS summit in Fortaleza, the leaders signed the agreement establishing the new developmental bank headquartered in Shanghai. 
see the declaration stressed that the ndb that is the new development bank will strengthen the cooperation among the brics members and will supplement the efforts of multilateral and regional financial institutions for global development thus contributing to the sustainable and balanced growth in addition to this considering the increasing instances of global financial crisis the brics nations signed brics contingent reserve agreement that is cra in 2014 as a part of fortaleza declaration at the 6th brics summit the cra actually aims to provide short term liquidity support to the members through the currency swap agreements to help them to mitigate the balance of payment crisis situation and further strengthen the financial stability here please note that the brics countries are considered the foremost geopolitical rival to the g7 bloc of the leading advanced economies implementing competing initiatives such as new developmental bank the brick contingent reserve agreement the brick pay and the brick joint statistical publication and the brick basket reserve currency with this let's see about what is brick pay see brick pay is a distributed payment messaging mechanism system by the brick member states it is similar to europe's swift and india's unified payment interface that is upi the project is a joint venture between the states to receive and make payments in their own local currency let's now see what is brics plus see brics plus is a global platform fostering innovation diverse collaboration and sustainability in 186 countries with a plan to include argentina egypt ethiopia iran saudi arabia and uae in 2024 it is committed to the global economic advancement here the brics plus was first mooted by the chinese foreign minister wang yi in march 2017 with the objective of widening the circle of friends of brics members that can bring unity among the developing countries and enhance south south cooperation that's all about this discussion so with this backdrop let us try to answer the question displayed here the concept of brics was first introduced by jim o'neil of goldman sachs in early 21st century the new developmental bank established by the brics nation focuses exclusively on financing military infrastructure in the member countries which of the statements given above are incorrect one only two only both one and two none the correct answer is option b two only the statement one given here is correct the concept of brics was introduced by jim o'neil of goldman sachs in the early 21st century but the statement two is incorrect because the new development bank was established by the brics nation with the primary focus of supporting the infrastructure and sustainable developmental projects in brics and other emerging economies not financing military infrastructure with this let's move to our next topic of discussion our next topic is minimum support price see this is most frequently asked area in the prelims discuss this topic in brief see msb is the price at which the government agrees to buy the crop from the farmers if the market price falls below it this ensures that farmers get a minimum income and helps maintain food security in the country for example let's say a farmer grows a wheat and the msp for wheat is set at 2000 per quintal if the market price falls below rupees 2000 the government will buy the wheat from the farmer at that price this gives farmer the assurance that even if the market prices are low they will still get a fair price for that crop see presently msp has been granted for 22 crops and a fair and remunerative price for sugar cane the mandated crops include 14 crops of the carib season and 6 rabi crops and two other commercial crops now let's see who decides what the msp would be and how see msp are announced by the union government but the government decides msp based on the recommendation of commission for agricultural cost and prices the cacp considers various factors into account before recommendation they are the demand and the supply of a commodity its cost of production the market price trends both domestic and international then the intercrop price parity the terms of trade between agriculture and non agricultural outputs that is the ratio of the prices of farm inputs and the farm outputs a minimum of 50% as a margin over the cost of production and the likely implications of msp on the consumers of that product let's now see about the calculation part see when calculating the cost of setting msp the commission for agricultural cost and prices considers three types of cost a2 a2 plus fl and c2 let's break down what each of these term means first is the a2 cost this is actually the paid out cost incurred by the farmer it includes expenses like seed fertilizer pesticides labor hired from outside 
and other direct expenses. Then the A2 plus FL cost. See, it is an addition to A2 cost. The A2 plus FL cost also takes into account inputted value of family labor. It means the value of the labor provided by the farmer's family members, even if they are not paid in the salary. The last one is C2 cost. The C2 cost is the highest of the three costs. It includes the A2 plus FL cost and further adds the rental value of farmer's own land after deducting the land revenue and the interest of the value of farmer's fixed capital assets, excluding the land. Know that all these three types of cost are calculated by CACP, but the recommended MSP presently is based on A2 plus FL cost only. And it is important to note that government doesn't buy all the crops at MSP. The actual procurement depends on the crop and the location. The Shant Kumar Committee in 2015 report revealed that only 6% of MSP was actually received by the farmers and also know that currently the MSP are not backed by law and the farmers cannot demand MSP as a right. So with this basic understanding, let's try to solve this question. Consider the following statement with respect to minimum support price that is MSP. MSPs are announced twice a year by the Commission for Agricultural Costs and Prices CACP. MSP is meant to set a ceiling price above which prices do not rise. Oil seeds are not covered under MSP. Commercial crops are covered under MSP. How many statements given above are correct? One only, two only, three only and all the four. The correct answer is option A, one only. See the statement one is incorrect because MSPs are announced by the government, not CACP. The statement two is incorrect because MSP is meant to set a floor price below which the prices do not fall not the ceiling price. Statement 3 is incorrect because we saw during our discussion that oil seeds are covered under the MSP and the statement 4 is correct. We have commercial crops which are covered under the MSP. With this, let's move to our next topic. Our next discussion is going to be about genetically modified crops. See, it is the most frequently asked area in the prelims. So let's start our discussion. See, genetically modified crops or the plants whose DNA has been altered using genetic modification technology. Know that the GM technology involves introduction of specific genes from often different species into the plant's DNA to confer desirable characteristics in the plant. Moreover, the main purpose of employing GM is to produce plants with the desired traits like higher yields, enhanced nutritional value, longer shelf life, etc. With these basics, let us see about BT cotton. In this crop variety, a pesticide resistant genes like Cry1AC and Cry2AB are obtained from the soil bacterium called Bacillus thurgigenesis are used. Know that they are inserted into the cotton DNA to make the plant resistant to the pest and in such process the cotton genes are modified and are called genetically modified cotton variety or BT cotton. Moreover, it is developed to fight the infestation caused by the ballworms. See, the Genetic Engineering Approval Committee approved the release of BT cotton for the commercial cultivation in 2002 in the western and the southern parts of the country. Now, let us be aware of another type of GM crop which is called herbicide tolerant BT cotton or HTBT cotton. See, the HTBT cotton variety adds another layer of modification to the genes and makes the plant resistant to the herbicide glyphosate. See, it contains CP4 EPSPS gene, which is isolated from the soil agrobacterium tumefaciens. Know that this bacterium produces a modified protein that allows the plant to tolerate glyphosate. Moreover, we should know that this variety has not been approved by the regulators in India. So far, we have seen about the basics of GM crops. Now, let us see about the procedure of approval in India. See, in India, Environmental Protection Act 1986 is an umbrella legislation which provides a holistic framework for the protection and the improvement to the environment. These rules are the only apex rules for the regulations of all activity related to genetically engineered organism and products. And know that the six competent authorities have been notified under the rules. The picture below depicts the authorities involved in the process. Please go through it. And this flowchart given here give you the procedure for the approval of GM crops. See here, the applicant will give the application to Institutional Biosafety Committee and the IBC will forward the application to the Review Committee on Genetic Manipulation and RCGM will review the data and give approval for the biosafety studies. And after this only, the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee gives approval for the field trials. And after this, 
the approval for the environmental release will be considered if the committee feels that a particular variety is suitable for environmental release then the geac will give approval for the commercial release but is this the final step of approval process the answer is no see geac evaluates the research into gm plants and recommends or disapproves their release in the form of field the final call is however taken by the environmental minister so with this basic understanding let's try to answer this question given here with reference to bt cotton consider the following statement it contains cp4 eps ps gene which is isolated from the soil bacterium agrobacterium tumefaciens it is an insect resistant transgenetic crop that can combat bollworm which of the statements given above are correct one only two only both one and two none of the above the correct answer is option b two only see the first statement is incorrect because bt cotton has genes like cry1 ac and cry2 ab and are obtained from the soil bacterium called bacillus thuringiensis whereas the gene cp4 eps ps gene is used in hstbt cotton and the second statement given here is correct it is an insect resistant transgenetic crop that can combat bollworm with this let's move to our next discussion our next topic for the discussion is gm mustard let us understand about gm mustard through a question with reference to genetically modified mustard developed in india consider the following statements gm mustard has a genes of soil bacterium that give plant the property of pest resistant to a wide variety of pest gm mustard has the genes that allow plant cross pollination and hybridization gm mustard has been developed jointly by iari and punjab agricultural university which of the statements given above are correct 1 and 3 only 2 only 2 and 3 only 1 2 1 3 Before answering this, let's analyze each of the statements individually. See, the statement one is not correct. DHM11 is a genetically modified mustard, and it is also herbicide tolerant mustard. DHM11 contains three genes: that is, Bar gene, Bar nis, and Bar star, sourced from a soil bacterium. See, these genes are obtained from a soil bacterium, but they do not give the plant the property of pest resistant to a wide variety of pests. Now, coming to the statement two, it is correct. See, it has mainly two genes, as said above, Bar nis and Bar star, that allow for cross pollination and hybridization in mustard, which is largely a self-pollinating plant because of its individual flowers containing both female and male reproductive organs. Now, with respect to the statement three, it is not correct. See, GM mustard has been developed by a team of scientists at Delhi University and not IARI and Punjab University. It was aimed at reducing India's demand of edible oil imports. They developed a Dara mustard hybrid Lavan. They developed Dara mustard hybrid Lavan, a genetically modified hybrid variety of mustard species. So the correct answer for the given question above is option B, two only. With this, let's move to the next topic. Our next topic is direct seeding of rice. Let us discuss this topic with the help of a prelims question. Now look at this question. Which of the following is correct regarding the direct seeding of rice technique, shortly known as DSR? Option A in DSR large quantity of irrigation water is required for puddling Option B the DSR is a labor intensive method of rice cultivation Option C in DSR the rice is sprouted in nursery and sprouted seedlings are then transplanted into the standing water Option D in DSR rice seed is sown and sprouted directly into the field Before answering this question let us know what is DSR or the direct seeding of rice See it is a rice sowing technique in which the rice seed is sown and sprouted directly into the field as you know in the conventional method the rice is sprouted in the nursery and the sprouted seedlings are then transplanted in the standing water this method is called puddle transplanting system shortly ptr as in dsr the rice seed is directly sown into the field this technique saves irrigation water labor and power as we have just discussed dsr technique is less time consuming and labor intensive than the conventional practice Hence, the farmers are favoring this technique, moving away from the traditional practice of sowing in nursery and then transplanting it. The DSR technique is called Thar Water DSR. Has been developed and successfully tested on a good scale at farmers' field. There is a reduced instance of nutrition deficiency, especially iron, because of lesser leaching of nutrients and deeper root development. It also improves groundwater recharge. This technique involves more precision. in timing and greater accuracy in operation hence it gives best yield and quality but there are some constraints associated with the shift from the conventional method to the dsr these include high weed infestation evolution of weedy rice 
increase in the soil brown pathogens namely nematodes nutrient disorder poor crop establishment lodging incidence of blast brown spots in leaf etc now coming back to the question see here the option a b and c are wrong since they describe the conventional sowing method therefore the correct answer is option d because in dsr the rice sown and sprouted directly into the field our next topic is about fertilizer subsidy in india let's start with the basic understanding about fertilizer industry in india it is one of the eight core industries see fertilizer has a minimum share in the index of core industries and also india is the second largest consumer of urea based fertilizer after china and also india ranks second in the production of nitrogenous fertilizers and third in phosphatic fertilizers whereas potash requirement is met through majorly imports since we have limited resource of potash here it is important to know that there are basically two types of fertilizers the first one is primary fertilizer see here the classification is based on the nutrients they supply to the soil like n p and k that is nitrogen phosphorus and potassium the next one is secondary fertilizers which includes calcium magnesium and sulfur the third one is micronutrients which includes iron zinc boron chloride etc let's now see about fertilizer subsidy here note that earlier no fertilizer subsidy was paid till 1977 but the oil crisis of 1973 led to increase in the fertilizer prices leading to a decline in the consumption and the increase in the food prices in 1977 government subsidized the manufacturers after the crisis of 1991 the government decontrolled the imports of phosphate and potash fertilizers but the urea imports is restricted here note that the urea fertilizer that is a nitrogen based fertilizer is the only fertilizer whose price is regulated by the government to put simply they are provided to the farmer at the statutorily notified price by the government now let us see the non urea based fertilizer their prices are fixed by the companies this does not mean that the farmers will be burdened this is because they are regulated under the nutrition based subsidy scheme let us see about nutrition based subsidy scheme that is nbs in brief know that nbs scheme is being implemented since 2010 by the department of fertilizers under ministry of chemicals and fertilizer under the scheme fertilizers are given at a subsidized rate based on the contained nutrients like nitrogen phosphate potash and sulfur know that it does not include urea based fertilizer also the fertilizers which are fortified with secondary and micronutrients such as molybdenum and zinc or given additional subsidy now let's see how the subsidy are being paid and who gets it see the subsidy goes to the fertilizer company although its ultimate beneficiary is the farmer who pays mrp less than the market determined rates whereas the company until recently were paid after the bagged material have been dispatched and received at the district retail point or the approved godowns but from the march 2018 the so called direct benefit transfer system that is dbt system was being introduced wherein the subsidy payment to the company would happen only after the actual sales to the farmers by the retailers with the dbt system each retailer there is over 2.3 lakh of them across india now has a point of sale machine linked to the department of fertilizers e uravarak dbt portal that's all about this discussion with this basic understanding let us try to solve this question displayed here consider the following statements about the nutrient based subsidy scheme under this scheme a fixed amount of subsidy is being provided on each grade of fertilizers depending upon its nutrient content it is applicable both urea and phosphatic and potassium fertilizers it is administered by the department of fertilizer under the ministry of chemicals and fertilizers which of the statements given above is or correct 1 only 2 and 3 only 1 and 3 only 1 2 and 3 the correct answer is option c 1 and 3 only based on our discussion we can identify that first and the third statements are correct whereas second statement is incorrect because the urea fertilizers the centers set a fixed minimum retail price whereas the prices for the non urea fertilizers are decontrolled with a central fixing nutrition based subsidy rates each year so therefore the right answer is option c that is 1 and 3 only with this let's move to our next topic for the discussion the next topic is forest rights act 2006 this is one of the most important area and also a frequently asked area in the prelims of upsc let's start our discussion see the scheduled tribes or the other traditional forest dwellers act 
is a piece of legislation passed in India on 18 December 2006. It has also been called Forest Rights Act, Tribal Rights Act, Tribal Bill, and the Tribal Land Act, etc. It is majorly concerned with four major rights. First one is title rights, that is the ownership to the land that is being farmed by the tribals or the forest dwellers as on 13th December 2005. Subject to a maximum of four hectares, ownership is only for the land that is actually being cultivated by the concerned family as on the date, meaning that no new land will be granted. The second one is use rights. It is for the minor forest produce and also includes ownership to the grassing areas, to the pastoral routes, etc. The next one is relief and the development rights to the rehabilitation in case of illegal eviction or the forced displacement and to the basic amenities subject to the restrictions for the forest protection. The next one is forest management right to protect forest and wildlife. Let us now see about the eligibility criteria. See, to qualify as a forest dwelling scheduled tribe and to be eligible for the recognition of the rights under FRA, three conditions must be satisfied. They are must be a scheduled tribe in the area where the right is claimed. Secondly, primarily resided in the forest or the forest land prior to 13-12-2005. Thirdly, depend on the forest or the forest land for the bona fide livelihood needs. See, according to the Section 2O of the Forest Rights Act, to qualify as other traditional forest dweller and to be eligible for the recognition of rights under FRA, two more conditions needs to be fulfilled. They are primarily resided in the forest or the forest land for three generations, that is 75 years prior to 13-12-2005. Secondly, depend on the forest or the forest land for the bona fide livelihood needs. And also know that the Act provides that the Gram Sabha or the Village Assembly will initially pass a resolution recommending whose rights to which resources should be recognized. And this resolution is then screened and approved at the level of Taluka. Now let us see about minor forest produce. See, minor forest produce is a subset of forest produce. The Scheduled Tribe and Other Traditional Forest Dwellers Act 2006 defines minor forest produce as all non-timber forest produce of plant origin. These include bamboo, bushwood, stumps, canes, cocoon, honey, waxes, lac, tendu leaves, medicinal plants and herbs, roots, among others. Let's now see about the MSP for minor forest produce scheme. See, the minimum support price minor forest produce scheme was started by the government of India in 2013 to ensure fair and remunerative prices to the minor forest produce gatherers. It is a centrally sponsored scheme. Its major objective has been stated in the following. Let's see one by one. Firstly, to provide a fair price to the minor forest produce gatherers for the produce collected by them and to enhance their income needs. Secondly, to ensure sustainable harvesting of minor forest produce. Thirdly, the scheme will have a huge social dividend for the minor forest produce gatherers, majority of whom are tribals. Let's now see about their implementation. Ministry of Tribal Affairs, Government of India is the nodal ministry for the implementation of this scheme. TRIFED acts as a nodal agency for the implementation and monitoring of the scheme through the state level implementing agencies. Further, the state designated agencies will undertake procurement of the notified minor forest produce directly from the gatherers at the Hearts Notified Procurement Centers at grassroot level at prefixed minimum support price. Let's now see about TRIFED, that is Tribal Cooperative Marketing Development Federation of India, which was established in 1987. It functions under the administrative control of Ministry of Tribal Affairs. The basic objective of TRIFED is to provide good price to the products made or collected from the forest by the tribal people. So that's all about this discussion. With this understanding, let us try to answer this question given here. Look at this question. With reference to Scheduled Tribes and Other Forest Dwellers Act 2006, consider the following statements. Gram Sabha is the authority responsible to determine the extent of an individual's claim on the forest right. The decision of the Gram Sabha on the record of the forest right shall be final and be binding. Which of the statements above are correct? 1 only, 2 only, both 1 and 2, neither 1 nor 2. The correct answer is option A, 1 only. See, the statement 1 is correct. The statement 2 is incorrect because any person aggrieved Gram Sabha's resolution may appeal in the sub-divisional level committee, then to the district level committee. The decision of the district level committee on the records of right is final and binding. See, the correct answer is option A. That's all for this discussion and very all the best for this year prelims.
And if you like this video, please hit like, share and subscribe. Thank you.